Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased today to be speaking with Dr. Diego Javier Luis about his book titled The First Asians in the Americas, A Trans-Pacific History, published by Harvard University Press at the beginning of 2024. This book is does a really interesting examination of Asian migration to the early Americas, mainly, but it's more complicated than just from the Philippines, Um, and looking at the journey, both sides of this uh, geographically on either side of the Pacific, as well as some of the varied impacts of this um, and some of the implications. So, Diego, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast to tell us about your book. Thank you for having me. Could you start us off, please, by introducing yourself a little bit and explaining why you decided to write this book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, My name is Diego Javier Luis. I'm an assistant professor of Latin American history at Tufts University. Um, And I I wrote this book for many reasons. Uh, And I think like like many folks setting out to write their first first book, um, I wrote it because it's the book that I always wish I had been able to read as a student. Um, both in undergrad and in graduate school. Uh, And the reason for that is when I started um, setting out to do some of the research for the book, and and there was one text in particular that was a major motivating uh, text for me to to write this, which is uh, an account from the 16th century of of China by a Spaniard. Um, Reading that um, exploded my categories that I had been thinking with to understand the history of colonial Latin America or the history of global empire. Um, thinking about the Pacific as a site within that constellation um, and really the limits of empire, of, of, of ambition and of the ability to exert some kind of sphere of influence um, in, the, in the Pacific uh, the limitations of that were were enormous motivations for me. Um, there's also a personal answer to that question, which is that my own family history um, is between Asia and Latin America as well. Um, I come from a Chinese Afro-Cuban background. And even though the histories of the people that I write about in the book are not you know, directly related to my own family history, you know, we came later in the 19th century. And the book is about uh, mostly about the 16th and 17th and into the 18th centuries, um, it was hard to not feel a kind of connection to the people I was writing about. Um, some folks talk about this as a, as a kind of diasporic kinship or a diasporic ancestry. Um, and kind of understanding the lives of people who you know long preceded that of my own family, but who were engaged with very similar kinds of, of uh, questions of identity and identification across the Pacific um, really motivated me to to proceed with this work. Mm. Either one of those would have been a great motivation, but to have both of them uh, definitely helps, uh, I think, understand kind of not just why you pursued the project, but also sort of the many different layers and nuances um, that ended up in the final version. So thank you for giving us that background. You mentioned a uh, time period there. So I'd like to talk a bit more about that. What sort of time period are we talking about and what kind of scale of migration does the book talk about? Yeah, so uh, the book is set during the early modern period between the late 16th and early 19th centuries. And that's because um, of the, the time frame of the main trade routes that cross the Pacific uh, uh, between the Philippines and Mexico, which were both uh, claimed by Spanish Empire uh, at this time. And so the ships that sailed that passage were called the Manila Galleons, and they ran roughly from 1565 to 1815. And it was precisely through those ships that we have this early wave of both free and enslaved Asian mobility across the Pacific to the Americas. Um, so that's the uh, that's the temporal delineation uh, of the book. And what about the numbers of people we're talking about here? Ah, uh, yes. And and as far as numbers, um, there are um, many estimates uh, as to precise numbers. The difficulty is that Spanish authorities never uh, give us uh, a precise number of how many people crossed the Pacific during this period. Um, but 
um, based on estimates of how many people the ships could hold, how many enslaved people crossed uh, the Pacific every year, how many Asian sailors were on the Pacific or, or on the ships crossing the Pacific. Um, we can estimate that roughly 20,000 um, Asians who were both free and enslaved uh, arrived in the Americas um, as a result of the Manila galleons. All right. I think just from what you've told us so far, there's going to be a whole bunch of listeners going, whoa, wait, I had not thought of this in terms of empire, just like um, you did kind of coming into the project. So let's get more into kind of what's going on here and the details. Take us to Manila. What's happening in Manila socially, economically, that is making it such a place for trans-Pacific movement of Asians during this time period? Yeah, so there's a lot of answers to this question. Uh, and this was actually one of my major uh, motivating research questions, too, uh, behind this project. Uh, because, again, um, th there's no sort of overview Spanish colonial source that explains, oh, this is what's happening in Manila that's generating, um, you know, this movement of Asians across the Pacific. And so a lot of that has to be systematically built from the ground up. Um, but a lot of things are, are beginning to converge uh, on Manila uh, during this period. One of those is uh, slave trading the, from South Asia, continuing through Southeast Asia and, and even into East Asia as well. Um, that's converging on Manila. Part of the reason for that is that um, from 1580 to 1640, uh, both Spain and Portugal are ruled by the same crown. And what that means is that um, this Portuguese sphere of imperial influence in South Asia uh, is now more deeply connected uh, by trade and movement to uh, the Spanish sphere of influence located in the Philippines uh, in Asia. And so you have an increasing uh, slave trade across both spheres uh, during the late 16th and into the early 17th centuries. And um, that means that Manila is uh, expanding as a slave trading hub and a, a portion of those captives that are arriving in Manila are, um, are being traded across the Pacific and sold at much higher prices uh, in Mexico. So part of the, the answer to that question is slave trading. Um, part, another important piece of that question is that uh, Manila was an incredibly, already an incredibly diverse site um, in the early modern world. And part of the reason for that is, um, is you have uh, Spanish silver uh, that's being mined in the Americas, being sent across the Pacific and sold to Chinese merchants. And there's sort of many reasons why Chinese merchants are interested in silver during this period, um, namely that um, there's a change in the taxation system in Ming. Uh, China from paper currency to silver. And so, uh, you know, by the turn of the 17th century, as many as 20,000 Chinese um, are living in Manila, far outnumbering the Spanish population. Uh, many of them sort of fall outside of the Hispanic purview. Um, there, Many of them do not convert to Catholicism, for example, and they sort of represent this existential threat um, uh, for the Spaniards in the colony. And so there's the tensions between the Spanish and the Chinese populations um, mean that, um, especially after 1603, when there's a, a major Chinese uprising that results in, in the deaths of, of almost all of the Chinese inhabitants of the colony, um, it means that Spaniards are now in um, a great, have a greater dependency on uh, indigenous people in the Philippines. And there are new opportunities for uh, collaboration with Spanish authorities, either as soldiers or as sailors, what have you, uh, in ways that further increase trans-Pacific um, mobility, uh, precisely because of those, those um, new opportunities. That's an interesting mix of things there. Um, so thank you for kind of giving us that glancing overview. Of course, it's worth reminding listeners that the book has loads more detail. So anyone who wants to get further into that, um, please do read the whole book. Uh, but I'm going to kind of continue our, I suppose, lighter touch version of it to get a picture of what's going on. Given what you've just told us, can you tell us what happens in 1603? 
and why this is such a key turning point in this history. Yeah, so I had I had briefly mentioned 1603, but it's it's important to pause and and uh, and consider what happened then mm. uh, because mm-hmm. it, it is such a major um, flashpoint in um, in colonial relations of, of power within Manila uh, because there's such a, a large Chinese population. Uh, you know, it's it's worth wondering: is Manila really? So to what extent is it a Spanish colony or to what extent is it, is it actually a Chinese enclave? Um, and, uh, and part of the reason why that represents such a threat to the Spaniards is, you know, they locate all these fears of, um, you know, non-assimilation, of uh, sort of eroding influence vis-a-vis uh, indigenous Philippine populations uh, onto the Chinese. And that leads to a wide range of discriminatory action uh, against the Chinese in the Philippines, from sort of arbitrary confiscation of goods to the persecution of cultural practices. And this all comes to a head um, in 1603 for many details uh, that, uh, you know, there's not really time to develop right now, but that are certainly in the book. Um, And so the Chinese population rises up against the Spaniards. and, And this is actually one of the most sort of violent uh, repressions um, of colonized populations during the early 17th century in which well over 10,000 Chinese are are massacred um, as a result of this uprising. And uh, and as I had mentioned, that fundamentally changes um, the relationships between various multi-ethnic populations in the colony, in part because the Chinese had supplied Uh, sort of not only the economic vitality that kept the colony going by um, buying Spanish silver and by selling various luxury goods uh, to the Spaniards in in return, which was one of the sort of the main justifications for the existence of a colony in Manila to begin with, but they also um, supplied basic food products to the colony. And so people began to starve afterwards because the Chinese had been massacred. Um, And so... Uh, and so that that creates this greater dependency um, on uh, indigenous Philippine populations. It also means that that Spaniards start buying captives at larger uh, rates than before uh, in order to uh, sort of bolster the coerced labor market uh, in Manila and um, to have people working fields, for example. Uh, so that the colony would not start. But anyway, those relationships would be fundamental um, to this expansion of trans-Pacific mobility um, following that into the 17th century. I'm glad we paused on that um, and you went into more detail because it is kind of quite a significant moment in this. But now that we've talked a bit about it, can you kind of take us on the next stage of the migration process what was it actually like to be one of these migrants crossing the Pacific? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I think it's it's difficult to, to rebuild that from the 21st century in a world in which, you know, you can fly to Asia and back to the Americas in, you know, 16 hours or 20 hours. And, you know, that seems difficult, right? But um, but no, crossing the Pacific during the early modern period on one of these galleons was usually a six-month endeavor um, without being able to stop uh, to take on supplies. And, you know, the ship was in many ways a, a floating prison uh, for the people on board. And uh, the conditions on the on these ships, um, the Manila galleons, were extreme because um, the ships had to sail north, rise um, to a latitude comparable to northern Japan in order to be able to cross the Pacific successfully. And um, that meant that the ships were exposed to harsh winter conditions, not to mention that it was impossible to carry enough food and water uh, for the entire journey as well. And it's just, you know, reading those accounts is is, um, really emphasizes just how abject those conditions, uh, shipboard conditions were. And of course, um, the Asians, uh, I- Asian passengers who are both free and enslaved, you know, many of them are sailors, often experience the, the most 
uh, difficult of those conditions. Their rations are cut first, for example. They rarely have uh, winter clothing to be able to um, you know, stay warm in, in such a, a cold environment. Um, but the other thing, too, is that the ships are trade, trade ships, fundamentally. So the hulls are filled with these luxury goods that are being purchased in the Philippines, uh, like silks, porcelain, lacquer. You also, excuse me, you also have South Asian textiles, textiles from the Philippines as well, um, that are uh, being loaded onto the ships. And, and what that means is there's really not room uh, below deck for people to stay unless you're a very wealthy passenger. So the overwhelming majority of Asians on the ships had to sleep um, topside, exposed to the elements or shoved into the forecastle or aftercastle, which is, you know, even though it has some enclosure, it's still open on one side um, to the outside. And, uh, and, and so the... And so that was one of the the tr really transformative elements that the travel itself actually um, actually creates this kind of commonality uh, in the in the experience of transiting through empire through its sheer difficulty, the high mortality rates, and you know after people land in, in Mexico, they remember who they crossed um, the Pacific with. They remember who else was on the ships, and that starts to forge um, some cross-cultural connections that are actually rather unique um, to the Pacific Passage in this period. So it's actually that last point I'd like to ask you more about, because it's not just um, obviously the transformative experience individually, or even just the connections you mentioned across cultures. You also talk about in the book that this enacts a transition between two different forms of Spanish race thinking. Can you take us through that aspect of the transformation? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so part of that is is because um, when we when we look at colonial documents and see in what capacity Asian peoples are crossing the Pacific, most of the time they're either crossing as captives or within a specific shipboard role, which is called the grumete, um, which is the cabin boy. It's the lowest ranking sailor, um, and one of the arguments that I make in the book is that, um, you know, grumetes could be um, uh, indigenous people of the Philippines, whether they're Tagalog or they're another ethno-linguistic group like the Kapampang An. Um, they could be from southern China. They could be from uh, from Japan. They could be from South Asia, um, from uh, from Southeast Asia. You have this convergence of people um, in this group. Um, that's the grumete. And so the argument is that that social category begins to collapse um, ethno-linguistic difference within Spanish colonial language. Um, and that flattening um, actually engenders similar kinds of experiences. It, uh, they experience um, Catholicism uh, collectively on the ships. You know, there's a very strict religious ritual um, that was supposed to be uh, in place on the galleons in which, you know, everyone would go to mass um, and uh, and have to recite certain prayers and and so forth. And so they're beginning to experience certain elements of colonialism collectively uh, in ways that upon arrival in Mexico, um, the people who are disembarking from the ship are simply perceived as a people. They're called Chinos, um, which literally means Chinese. But in colonial Mexico, it becomes a term that can refer to anyone who's not European and sometimes not African as well. But there's some fluidity there um, who's uh, who's disembarking the ship. So people who are the grumetes, who, who are the enslaved Asian captives, um, they get reduced um, into this Chino category, and I'm arguing that that process of flattening uh, begins uh, during the crossing itself and how um, shipboard labor is organized. Can you tell us a bit further about the shipboard organization in terms of labor? Were there different jobs for different ethnic groups as they were considered in Manila, or how did that work if we're talking here about mixing of groups on board? Yeah, so um, so this is the point that I'm making about the grumetes, that um, so even though you have 
a sort of many ethno-linguistic groups who occupy, um, uh, uh, who, who are grumetes, they're experiencing shipboard labor in distinctly similar ways. Um, there's only really one exception to that, um, which are uh, carpenters who are from a particular area in the Philippines. But other than that, um, you have um, you have a wide range of people who are who are sort of being collapsed into this one group, having to sort of find a common language to speak together. Um, some of them already know each other in Manila, but many of them do not. And so this is a moment in which you have the forging of multi-ethnic connections in ways um, that are more intensified uh, from being sort of restricted spatially to the confines of this ship uh, crossing the Pacific for as many as six months. Um, so that sort of helps explain uh, some of the connections that we see emerging after arrival in, uh, in Mexico, uh, where, for example, uh, in marriage records, you have uh, folks who had crossed on the same ship, bringing um, bringing these people to testify to the legal nature of their marriage. Uh, you have uh, people crossing ships together who choose each other as godparents for their children. Um, so that kind of collapsing into that shipboard role begins to indicate how some of those connections may have formed. Thank you for kind of going into that in a bit more detail. Um, I think it's helpful to understand kind of the, the impact of that, especially given how far away it is from our experience now. I'd like to ask more about the term Chino, um, given that, as you said, it was applied kind of to anyone getting off the ships, uh, regardless of where they actually might have been from and the different linguistic groups. Can you tell us more about the development of this term and kind of why it was that Chino was the word sort of applied to any of these migrants? Yeah, yeah. So the word Chino is, is really an, an enigma. Um, and again, this was sort of one of my um, major points of focus and inspiration uh, going into this research, because it's it's such a strange thing on the surface. Or why are all these people being called Chinos? And again, there's really no... Um, uh, no Spanish source that fully explains what this term means when it first enters colonial language. Um, so, uh, so the first piece of unraveling that puzzle was trying to understand why the term Chino was the one selected um, and, and that becomes codified that can refer to any Asian. And so one of the reasons behind that um, I looked into sort of colonial naming practices more broadly uh, and found that um, that especially with geographies that were poorly known at the time, that often often sort of a single group or place was selected to represent the whole. So uh, one example of that would be calling the Canary Islands the Canary Islands after the one island called Gran Canaria. Um, another example of this is um, in the, there was uh, one island in particular in what's now the Philippines that was called La Isla Filipina or the Philippine Island. And then that name gets extended to the entire uh, archipelago. Uh, a similar um, process happens uh, with Asia as a whole from the perspective of Mexico. Um, because so many trade goods are arriving from China and because uh, there are sort of these best-selling texts being published at the time that talk about um, China in an ethnographic way. Um, sort of, it becomes the most recognizable polity uh, in Asia, and so all of Asia gets called La China or China. Um, and so the people who are arriving from across the Pacific from La China get called Chinos, um, and uh, and so that actually uh, begins to have some important legal repercussions as well uh, in colonial Mexico. And this is because many of the people who get called Chinos in Mexico were not called Chinos in the Philippines. They're called, uh, often called another uh, name, which is itself another colonial category, which is the category of Indio. Um, Indio at the time designated a, a vassal relationship with the crown uh, 
by people who were indigenous inhabitants of lands claimed by uh, by Spain. And uh, it, it indicates this, this fundamentally exploitative relationship with the crown, but there were also some uh, legal protections that they were supposed to have, even if in practice they did not always enjoy said protections. Um, but the process of going from being called Indio in the Philippines to Chino in Mexico actually removes those people from said protections. And the most important of those is um, uh, uh, from enslavement. Uh, so by being called Chino, there is no sort of legal recourse to, um, uh, to contesting the, le- the, le- the legitimacy or legal nature of one's captivity. Hmm. Were differences in laws and legal kind of permissions and rights the only thing that kind of restricted someone called a Chino? Like what, what else did it mean to be called Chino beyond just what the law said? Yeah, I, I, well, I mean, there's, there's sort of a lot of legal repercussions that are worth talking about, but there's... Um, well, no, 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 Ben, please talk more about the legal stuff and then we'll go beyond the law. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the other thing that it does is um, because people who are called indios um, were considered sort of new converts or neophytes in the Catholic faith, they were not supposed to be um, denounced to the Inquisition. They were given sort of a, a specific... Uh, religious dispensation from inquisitorial denunciation. Chinos did not have that dispensation. So people who were um, protected from the Inquisition in the Philippines were now newly vulnerable to the Inquisition after arriving in Mexico. Um, There are also laws, um, particularly during the 17th century, that uh, apply to more broadly to what we call the sistema de castas or the caste system uh, in Colonial Mexico, uh, and you know, Chino is is one of these castes or castas. Indio is another, but you also have Afro diasporic uh, castas, um, which are the categories of negro and mulatto, as well. And so there are laws uh, that are intended to control the mobility of said populations, to control in some cases what kinds of trades they can participate in, um, where they can live, even. And uh, if they can carry weapons or ride horseback, uh, trade goods in particular places. And so when uh, Asians become Chinos after arrival, they now sort of uh, these laws now pertain to uh, to them as well. And so there's, there's sort of a wide range of legal repercussions to to the Chino category. But sort of more broadly than that, um, they become sort of identified as part of this growing multi-ethnic mass, um, which oftentimes is really the majority population um, in colonies in Mexico. And uh, there's sort of this perennial, not dissimilar from how the Chinese were perceived in Manila, this sort of perennial fear of whether or not these people can be trusted and uh, if they're truly assimilated, if they're true Catholics, so on and so forth. And so there's this kind of way in which Chinos become identified as part of this broader mass, which is a sort of vague threat um, or unknown entity uh, in colonial society. And, um, and, and that's, that's sort of fundamental to how they're racialized uh, as a group, as an undifferentiated group specifically. Hmm. Yeah, the undifferentiated nature of it really just keeps coming up here with all sorts of consequences. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Can we talk about the links that are made between uh, groups and communities, including, for example, on the ships themselves, um, and kind of fit that into what you've been telling us about the sort of racial organization system, I suppose, imposed by the state? Um, what happened to these cross group connections that maybe were formed on the ships once they got to shore? What sort of communities do we see? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, so this was, again, something that, that I was very interested in in the research, um, which is, you know, to what extent did, um, did Chinos perhaps uh, contest this category or embrace it in some ways and sort of form new connections with other people who are called Chinos? 
right? But but with whom they did not necessarily share any sort of common background or language or or cultural connection. Um, and so uh, so the first sort of element of that is uh, when Asians are sort of get subsumed into the Chino category, you have a group of people called Chinos who are saying, hey, wait, hold on a second. I'm not just a Chino, right? I'm a Chino of this particular background. And, and one of the backgrounds that comes up the most is uh, the Kapampangan um, ethnicity, which is from the Philippines, from the area just north of Manila. And this is particularly, particularly important because they're one of the groups that was sort of considered trusted in the Philippines, you know, and they serve in colonial armies and um, some of them sort of become colonial elites in their own right. And so folks who, who were Kapampangan and crossed the Pacific, ended up in Mexico, oftentimes referenced these records of service and sometimes of privilege uh, in the Philippines and, and hopes to continue that in Mexico to say that, to differentiate themselves really from the Chino category. Um, but so, so, um, so there are exemptions made uh, for people um, like some of the Kapampang An soldiers, but even those who don't petition for sort of specific um, exceptions to uh, legal restrictions, still find a way to reconstruct some measure of diasporic community in Mexico as well. And so, um, you know, I found networks of Kapampangan traders uh, who sort of maintained uh, friendships in Mexico or who uh, sort of loaned money to each other on credit. Uh, and so you can start to, with these sources, rebuild um, what some of these communities looked like. Um, the other thing is, uh, is you have people uh, who did not share an ethno-linguistic background who, um, who end up selecting each other for, for marriage, for example, and for godparentage at higher rates simply because they're also Chinos. So even though Chinos are, are in general um, an extreme minority population uh, within uh, central Mexico, it's still, I think, quite noteworthy that nonetheless they are selecting each other for these close, intimate relationships um, and connections at higher rates, even if at higher rates compared to other groups, even if they did not share um, an ethno-linguistic background. Uh, and, you know, that's happening not only in Mexico, but there's uh, a really uh, intriguing example of, um, of a tribute register in Lima, in Peru, beginning of the 17th century, that's also showing these kinds of multi-ethnic uh, connections in households or um, people freeing, uh, raising money to free each other from enslavement as well, to buy each other out um, from captivity and and those are just a few of the, the sort of really remarkable examples of newly formed diasporic connections that are happening, um, in part as a result of being sort of collectively racialized as one group. Hmm. Yeah, no, that, that is, I think remarkable is a great word for it. Um, so thank you for giving us those examples. Can I pick up, though, on that um, second example? Because it's in, as you said, Peru. To what extent was this kind of Chino collective identity happening just in Mexico versus across the entire Spanish empire, even in Spain itself? Yeah. So, um, so the first thing uh, to note is that when Asians are arriving in the Americas, you know, most of them are entering through the port of Acapulco, which is along the Pacific coast in central Mexico, but there is a dispersion outwards as well. You know, most are staying in central Mexico, but you have, Asian sailors, for example, that are participating in expeditions that go up the west coast of what's now the U.S., as far north as, as uh, what's now Oregon. Um, you have a movement southward towards, south, towards Central America, um, and you have, uh, you know, cases of Asians showing up in the Guatemalan capital of Santiago, um, or at least what was the colonial capital at the time. And uh, you have a movement that continues even further south uh, with this example in, in Lima, 
um, which, um, you know, this tribute register, which records over a hundred um, Asian people uh, residing in the capital. Um, and it's, it's also important to note that, you know, you also have a transatlantic movement as well. You have uh, Asians who are crossing Mexico, uh, boarding ships in Veracruz, which is an Atlantic facing port, and then uh, continuing on to Spain and even Italy uh, in some cases. So, you know, this is, this is really a global movement. And as we start, and what I, I was, I was very interested in this question about the Chino label, sort of what happens to it beyond Mexico. Um, and what I found is that as distance from Mexico increases, you have an instability uh, introduced in, in the Chino label. You have people um, who are more successful at contesting it, and you have a kind of slippage in category as well. And so one example of that is um, there's um, an Asian captive who runs away uh, in, uh, in what's now Honduras, and he shows up in Guatemala um, a couple of years later, and this is in the 1650s. And he's sort of apprehended by uh, this uh, indigenous constable who describes him as a mulatto or as a, as a mixed black person. And uh, when he sort of turns this person in to the Spanish authorities, uh, and they ask him to, to tell where he's from. He says that he was born into uh, enslavement in the Philippines. And then that's the point at which the Spanish authorities say, wait, hold on a second, you're a Chino. And so for me, that's one of these really um, fascinating examples in which you can see the, the very constructed nature of these categories and how you know, oftentimes they're really dependent on who is doing the observing um, and how the person is in question is also presenting themselves. Um, and, uh, and it also indicates that there is this kind of um, Afro-Asian connection too in terms of categorization. And, um, and that's something that's, that's a really um, defining feature of enslaved communities, particularly in central Mexico, is um, how, uh, how racialization, even beyond the Chino category, puts Asians in frequent um, contact with, uh, with Afro-Mexicans as well. Um, so anyway, the, the, the point is that the Chino category becomes more unstable as we move further away uh, from central Mexico which is a really interesting finding um, to look at that change over geography. Can I also ask you to take us through change over time? Um, what, if anything, changes as we move farther in time all the way to the 18th century for these populations? Yeah, that, so this is uh, one of the major questions uh, uh, behind uh, the final chapter of the book. Uh, which moves forward into the 18th century and then even right up until the period of independence, the early 19th century. I was very interested in finding or seeing, seeing if there were um, sort of long-term continuities um, in Asian mobility and also leading into um, sort of the better known 19th century waves of Asian movement to the Americas, primarily through conscripted labor and indenture. Uh, predominantly in the in the Caribbean, Circum Caribbean, um, but so the one of the major things that actually changes for for Asians in uh, in the Americas by the 18th century is formal emancipation from enslavement. So in 1672, there's an emancipation order that's um, that frees Chinos alongside a number of other indigenous groups um, in uh, in Mexico. And, uh, and what I found is that, you know, you, even though we do have this emancipation order, the enslavement of Asians does not sort of suddenly end. Uh, and this is the case with, you know, emancipation orders in the Americas more broadly too. Um, and, and, and even more broadly than that, uh, just decrees that are made from Spain uh, are very inconsistently implemented throughout the colonial period in the Americas. And oftentimes they're implemented solely to the extent uh, in which they, they serve an entrenched colonial elite. So, you know, um, uh, so some people are freed 
as a result of this emancipation order. But even decades later, even by the early 18th century, we still have some cases of um, of Asians in captivity. But certainly by the mid 18th century, the late 18th century, um, uh, the overwhelming majority of Asians in the Americas are, are now free. And so that um, that is a, is a very important change in the kind of relationship of, of Asian subjects with colonial authorities. Um, I also found that, you know, even though the Manila Galleon is um, the trade route really becomes seriously imperiled um, at various points during the 18th century, you know, Asians still remain the majority group of sailors um, on these ships. Um, there's even a, a new trade route uh, towards the end of the 18th century that directly connects the Philippines to Spain through the Indian Ocean and around the Cape of Good Hope. Um, Asian sailors remain prominent uh, on that new route as well um, and uh, and are still sort of a, a visible um, subset of colonial populations, even right up until um, independence, uh, you know, in the 1820s. And, uh, and even when the Manila Galleon line ends as a result of um, you know, Morelos, one of the famed uh, independence leaders in Mexico, even after he burns Acapulco and, and that leads to a, a snow, has a snowball effect that, that culminates in the end of the Manila Galleon line. There are still some, um, some uh, connections from other ports, namely San Blas, which is to the north, that keep Mexico connected to the Philippines for a few, a few years later. Um, and for me, this is this sort of extension of trans-Pacific connection is super important because um, because uh, conscripted labor in the beginning in, in the Caribbean is beginning precisely at the same time. And so, rather than thinking of you know, okay, the early modern period of Asian mobility is ending, and now we can talk about a quote-unquote modern period um, beginning in the 19th century, which is something that's quite different. Um, I'm actually arguing that the um, conditions the sort of inter-imperial competition that's contributing to the end of the Manila Galleon line um, is simultaneously enabling new channels of, um, of movement from Asia to the Americas that uh, become, uh, 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 you know, the, the period of indenture, of Asian indenture uh, in the Caribbean. So there's really more of a bleeding between the two um, periods of movement rather than uh, you know, two separate spheres. Hmm. Which is in and of itself a very helpful contribution. And that's, disc you know, that's not counting all the other parts of the book that help us understand things we didn't um, already. Is there anything else you want us to know or think we should know about the book as we're doing this highlights tour and coming to the end of it? Anything you want yeah. readers in particular to take away? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's there's a number of things that um, you know, sort of be, beyond uh, beyond making you know these academic arguments about um, about Asian mobility, what it looked like, um, you know, who it involved, how long it lasted, and 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 sort of it, it's it's nature. Um, I really, you, you know, I return to the personal here when I think about what I what I hope for readers to take away from the book, uh, in part because you know I I grew up in uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, in the South as a mixed kid, um, you know I didn't have really an opportunity to study what I would call you know my own history or history of people like me, um, you know, and part of this is is how canons are constructed, right, and what stories are silenced and left out of said canons. Um, and, you know, I, I, I never really felt a kind of affinity towards either an Asian American narrative, in part because I saw that as a very U.S. story that didn't incorporate Latin America at the time, or, or a very West Coast story, for example. Um, I also felt sort of outside of the Latino narrative as well, which I thought of as a kind of New York City and Miami story, um, at least in terms of Cuban diaspora. Um, so what I'm really hoping readers take away from this book is they see elements of their own experiences in the stories of the people that I write about. I mean, in this book, I'm I'm 
even though I'm talking about vast geographies and vast time periods, it's really rooted in the stories of the people who are making the crossing, their lived experiences, the decisions and choices um, that they made during their lives and why they made them. So I'm really hoping that um, that elements of those experiences resonate with uh, with the readers of the book. Um, the other thing is, you know, the time that I was writing this is really the height of or finishing the book rather was during the height of the pandemic. Um, you know, seeing the really troubling statistics of of um, anti uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander hate. Uh, of course, there's a very long history of that, and it's sort of only now being more systematically recorded. Um, but um, but I was finishing the book in that context, and you know, at least for me, doing this work. Um, was actually quite empowering um, in the sense that, you know, knowing that Asians have been coming and going from the Americas for centuries, um, you know, even before the founding of Jamestown and certainly well before the founding of, uh, of this country of, um, uh, that, that I'm in, uh, the United States, um, I, what I'm really hoping is that this work can foster really a sense of, uh, of hemispheric belonging. Uh, and can and really shift the discourse um, around uh, around that. So, uh, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm hoping folks take away. Brilliant. Those are great ways, I think, to close our discussion on the book. But I do have one more question. Um, obviously, this has just come out, and it's been a huge project to get it to this point. But is there anything you might have your eye on next, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on this exact subject that you'd like to highlight or preview for our listeners? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, so one, I'm, I'm actually making a podcast of my own um, with uh, a couple of, of collaborators that's around the topic of the book, but from a different angle. It's sort of the story behind the book. And it's a, it's a very personal story. Uh, and it's very much about how one's personal experiences inform um, the perspective or the way that we approach uh, historical subjects and topics. Um, so that is uh, is in progress and will hopefully be available um, by May or June of this year. Um, the second major project um, that I'd like to mention is is the next book project. So as I was doing research for this book, one of the things that really caught my attention and, and surprised me, um, again, because it's a story that's sort of um, that's sort of in the blind spot of multiple fields is how both nodes of trans-Pacific trade, both Manila in the Philippines and Acapulco in Mexico, um, both had very prominent, visible, and socially mobile um, Black populations. And, um, and in particular, um, for Manila, I was, I was very surprised to learn that even by the 1630s, there were hundreds of free Black people um, in the city, you know, roughly half of the Spanish population. Uh, so, uh, so I'm wanting to uh, write a, a, a book that um, that puts these sites in conversations and, and shows that at the same time there was um, and, and we can speak about uh, an early modern Black Pacific uh, existing between these nodes of, of Spanish Trans-Pacific trade. Okay, well, both of those sound like very cool projects. So thank you for those previews, things to look out for. But of course, in the meantime, uh, listeners can read the book we've been discussing. Again, titled The First Asians in the Americas, A Trans-Pacific History, published by Harvard University Press. Diego, thank you so much for coming to speak with us on the podcast. Thank you for having me.